Hey, good morning and happy Father's Day. As we get started this morning, we got a video that we want you guys to enjoy. Life is always fair. I really enjoy repeating myself over and over again. I just love when the kids talk back to me. I don't care if you get a job this summer. I don't care if you get detention. Uh, uh, I, I can't open this jar. See if mom can open it. Just take your time in there, okay? No means maybe. Hey, why don't you bring that ball inside and play with it? Hey, don't put that back where you found it. Just leave it on the floor. Ew, bacon. If you put a dent in the car, it's really no big deal. It's 10 a.m. Go back to bed. Look, whatever your friends are doing, just do the exact same thing. I got more than enough sleep last night. If your friends are okay with it, then I'm okay with it. Stop signs are just a suggestion. You don't need a chaperone. You don't need a seat belt. You don't need a savings account. You should buy the jeans with the holes in them. Hey, we're all gonna go to church, but you can just sleep in, okay? Can we please just hang out in here for another 10 minutes? Hey, can we get some more bickering back there? All right, bills! Yay, traffic! Woohoo, taxes! Yes! Laundry! Hey, can you kids come in here and jump on my bed? Quick, go tell mom what happened right away! You don't need to finish your dinner. Hey, look at your phone when I'm talking to you. I wish I had a smaller TV. We got you that phone for a reason. Texting boys. All right, everyone, listen up. Mom and I are going out of town this weekend, so please, mess up the whole house while we're gone. Please throw a few parties while we're gone. Please forget about the dog entirely while we're gone. Hey, when you're finished pouring that, can you just leave it out on the counter all day? Thanks. Hey, <laughs> oh, there was one last one. I think it was something about jump off the tree. Uh, <laughs> We're glad that you guys uh, have joined us for worship this morning. We guys stand and pray with me as we begin. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can come together and worship. We can come together in joy and laughter and celebrate our dads and our graduates. And I always ask that you be pleased with, uh, with, with our time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You live, you die, you said it.
Amen. Hey, why don't you greet one another real quick? Find your seats if you would. We have a couple announcements. Uh, a couple announcements for you to go to go over for this morning. Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. I'm glad you were able to be in, in church with us. Thanks for joining us in worship. It is a blessing to worship with you. Um, dads, I hope you are, your Father's Day is off to an amazing start. Hope you were able to do all the things that you wish to do today and are appreciated and can rest a little bit or do whatever you want. So hope it's a good day to uh, appreciate you. Uh, a couple announcements that we have before um, I'm going to invite up our graduates. Um, first of all, I just wanted to make sure we have treats and snacks and um, all sorts of stuff for our dads and for our graduates. So dads, you should have received something when you came in. I think you're receiving something else when you leave, just being showered with appreciation today. So I hope you, hope you stopped and received that. We also, I think we have snacks or something, refreshments for the um, graduates as well. So after church, hang out a little bit and so I'll celebrate our graduates, celebrate, celebrate our dads today. Um, this week, you should have received an email that's asking for a couple needs in the church. Um, I wanted to give a thank you to those who were able to help out a little bit at uh, the Hodgins House. as They have lots of cleanup left to do. I'm sure you guys still have lots of cleanup left to do um, after the storm that hit kind of locally. A little tornado hit their house, and there are trees and branches and stuff kind of still everywhere, I'm assuming, right? A little bit left? Okay, so if you guys, if there's still... If you'd like to help out, just contact, I'd say reach out to Ken and Barb. They sit right up here in the front, and you can, they're super great people. So say, hey, I'd like to come over and help, and they'll say, that'd be awesome. I'd appreciate that. So you can connect with them. Uh, thank you if you came out and helped. Another part of that email was there's a family has a financial need, and I asked you to come to church prepared to um, help with that. So if you came and you brought some cash, if you could bring, uh, checks are fine, but cash is more immediate. If you brought that and forgot to put it in the offering plate, just make sure the offering basket, uh, make sure you do that on your way out. Um, if you have a check, you can just write it out to Trinity UMC and make sure it's just noted special offering, and we'll make sure the family um, gets that. So I think that's all the announcements. Is there anything going on with? Big graduation week. It is a big graduation week. Well, baccalaureate. There won't be, <clears throat> youth won't be meeting Wednesday because we'll have baccalaureate Thursday, graduation Friday, but we're starting our summer next week. So June 29th, anybody that just got out of sixth grade going into seventh is welcome to join us. We're going to work through the chosen and there's also meals out back that you can, <clears throat> the others can sign up to make us dinner because we're, we like to eat. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Who'd you guys get yeah. to speak at baccalaureate? Uh, this cool guy, I don't know, he works at some church. Oh, really? That's me. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping you'd say me and I was going to make a self-deprecating joke, but you ruined it. So thank you. Yep. Um, <laughs> happy Father's Day, buddy. I'm going to <laughs> invite up our graduates that we are celebrating today. So if you are here and uh, we'd like to recognize you. We have a gift for you. I am going to ask you just to share just a little bit of where you are going with your life next year. So if you are here, if you would come up. We if you don't pray. come up, you don't get the gift, Emma. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, if you don't come up, you don't get the gift, and I'll use it. Uh, Reagan Shittister, Brianna Rosequist, mm. Emma Ruhlman, Katie Spath, and, Emily, and, and Amy Sprague, if you guys would come up. It is not that hard. And I have a hard last name. Everybody says my last name wrong. I don't know what you guys did, scared off all the boys, but it is great. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, there, there was a whole separate bulletin put together with pictures, and uh, we asked the graduates to sort of share um, some of their thoughts and where they're going. But I would like if you guys would just say, you know, what's your plan for this next year? And uh, Pastor Justin is going to pray over you guys, and we have a card and a gift for you guys for your graduation. So Katie, you're used to speaking on the mic by now. You could just preach later. So <laughs> if you would share with the church, um, what, what are you doing with your life this, um, the next year in the fall? I will be attending Bose's Hughes Center for their LPN course and then going into healthcare. I will be attending Damon University in Amherst. I got into their direct entry BCP program. So I will be pursuing my doctorate in physical therapy. I'll be going to basic training and advanced individual training for the New York Army National Guard. I'll be going to Hillsdale College. Um, I'm going to play basketball and major
Children Biochem, and he comes and kind of vouches from the head. <laughs> um, I'm going to GCC, and I don't know what I'm doing, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Would you celebrate our graduates with me? I'm behind you, but I'm gonna pray for you anyways, because I was like, I was gonna take that mic, but then it all got weird, so uh, let, me just, let, me just, <laughs> let me just pray for you. God, uh, I think of these women, and I think of what you're going to do in their lives, uh, whether they know exactly where you're taking them, uh, or whether they're still trying to figure out what exactly you want them to do. God, we thank you so much that uh, regardless of our plans, you direct our steps, and that's what we ask for these girls. Uh, Lord, you, you know where they're going. You know what they're doing. You know who they're going to impact. More than anything, we pray that you would hold them close to you. More than anything, we pray that they would understand that they have a church family that is here that loves and will support and do anything for them. We pray that they would understand that you love them more than anything, and nothing they have done or will do will change that. God, we pray this just incredible blessing that whether they're staying local, whether they're going far away, whether they're uh, doing athletics or, or medical or, or anything, any business, any anything, that they would trust that you are good, that you love them, that you will never let them go. And that the people that they surround themselves with is who, who shapes them. And so we ask that you would give them incredible connections, incredible relationships, and that you would protect them and use them for what you want to use them for going forward. Lord, we thank you so much for getting them through high school. And we pray that you'd help them as they continue uh, to get through college and, and the next steps in their lives and where they're headed. So, God, we thank you so much for these women and ask your, your special blessing on them in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's continue and add it to this prayer together. Lord God, you have given us so many reasons to, to celebrate. That's a huge part of why we are gathered. We gather in praise and thanksgiving of who you are, what you have done, where you have guided us in our lives, be it fresh out of high school with most of our life ahead of us, trusting in you to guide the next step, or be it later on in life, looking back on your provision, looking back on how you have guided looking at the family that you've given us, what we've been able to, how we've been able to be used by you and everybody in between. Lord, you are good and you are faithful. Thank you for your church. Thank you for these students. I thank you for the fathers in our lives and the blessings that they have been to us and continue to be to us. I thank you for the fathers who have, have gone ahead and are now with you. Um, and um, today is a bit of a sad day for, for some family and so, Lord, but we just do remember the blessing that our fathers either were to us or continue to be to us. Equip me, equip us as dads to be Christ-like in our parenting, in how we love our children, and how we love our spouses, in our dedication to your church, and where you have called us to go. So bless our families, Lord. We want to strive to be parents and spouses and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and grandparents that reflect you. That cannot happen without your equipping. That cannot happen without our dependence on the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, use us. Take us where you want us to go. Use our words. Use our thoughts. Take our, our habits, how we're spending our time, how we're spending our money, our approach to work, our approach to everything, Lord. May it reflect you. Lord, thank you for the blessings of this day. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for issues and areas of our world that um, it is hard to celebrate, that there are just difficult things going on. We pray for your healing and, and your, your unity in, in our nation, in our church, in our denomination. Um, there's just a lot of just brokenness and, and division and things that are not of you going on. And I pray, Lord, that you keep us on your path, keep us rooted in your truth as we strive to bring others with us, as we strive to show others the love and grace of Jesus Christ. So Lord, heal what needs to be healed. Heal areas of our world that are war-torn right now. Heal and bring your peace in Ukraine. Heal and bring your peace in areas of our nation that, that are violent, that are recovering from these terrible shootings. Lord, bring your healing and your peace and guide
guide your church to know how to partner with you in that. You've called us to be your hands and feet, to play a role in bringing your kingdom here, your kingdom come. May that be evident in your church. So God, thank you for the, the awesome blessings of today. You are so good. And oftentimes that is really obvious. But Lord, for the people where that is not so obvious right now, I pray your blessing over them. Bring your healing, bring your unity, bring your peace. May your church always reflect you, reflect you well. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You guys stand and continue to worship with us.
salvation and he is our prize drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes of grace he is in ocean we are all sinking so heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss my heart turns violent a song, right? Jesus Messiah. We sing and we pray to a God that we feel often is so distant. And yet if we stop and look at one day of our lives, we realize what he does. Goes unnoticed. We celebrate Father's Day, right? Maybe you didn't have a great father, maybe you had an amazing one. But I feel like we have to pause for a second and realize that God of the universe loves us enough, even for this moment, here and now, to be able to gather to sing songs to him. I don't sing songs to other people. <laughs> so when we sing how he loves us, maybe your morning wasn't amazing, but I want you to stop and think about the fact that the God of the universe allows this moment, this place and time, not just to celebrate dads and graduates, but to speak to us. Like, let us sit and look at who he is, at his word. To let us do so in fellowship with other believers, other people that think the same way we do. They don't think everything the same way we do. My days are just so full, and I don't stop to think about this reality. Let's sing this as a family. that we don't forget it. Amen. You can have a seat. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that powerful and needed reminder. Any of the kids who are four years old to fourth grade can skedaddle to Children's Church if you would like. If you are younger than four years old, you can go to the nursery if you'd like. You probably need to be accompanied there by a parent. Before we get um, into the message for today, I have just a little bit of sad news. Um, my friend's obese parrot died, and he's really sad about it, but it is a huge weight off his shoulders. Thank you, Tyler. Don't forget to tip your ushers. All right. Um, <laughs> the only one I have, I'm a dad, I'm entitled, we're good. It is out of my system. I heard that one online the other day, and I was like, that's a good one. That's the one I'm rolling with. All right, happy Father's Day um, for all the dads out there. I hope it is a blessed one for you. Mine just got a whole lot better. Um, today, I think, is a good day to reflect on 
uh, the examples that our dads have left for us. I know not everybody had a dad in the picture or had this ideal father. I don't think many of us have a perfect, or any of us have a perfect dad we can think about, but I think it is good to, if you are able to think about, you know, what are the ways our dad has left an example for us? Um, what about my dad do I want to carry forth? What about my dad do I want to live out? And I was thinking about that a little bit. Um, I love my dad. My dad's awesome. Um, I, th I was thinking about when I was a little kid, and we'd have like Thanksgiving and Christmas at our house, and my grandma and grandpa would be there, aunts and uncles and cousins would be there. The house would be full, and my dad would sort of just be this, um, sort of like the center of attention, but not in an arrogant way, but just he's telling stories and making people laugh, and everybody's just roaring with laughter. Around, and, and like, I just want to be able to share that kind of joy with others that my dad was able to give. And he still does. He's still a super funny guy. I love my dad a lot. Um, he might be watching. He might not. If he's not watching, I'm going to be on him later. But um, <laughs> I think more importantly, way, way, way more importantly, um, my dad instilled in my sister and myself, our whole family, the importance of following Christ. That that was, that was never an option. Going to church was never an option. Not going to church, rather, was never an option. We were always going as a family, no matter what. And there's no way I would be the follower of Jesus I am today without my dad. So I, I'm thankful for where he has brought me in my life, the example that he has been for me. And I hope you have a similar story to share uh, in some ways. But as we take Father's Day, it's, it's you know, natural, normal to reflect on how we can carry our good, good qualities of our dads. Way more importantly, so much more importantly for us as individuals and us as a church family is considering this life-changing question that I hope you've given some time and thought to as, as, if you've been a follower of Christ for any amount of time, is, you know, what does it mean to be like Jesus? And on the surface, that sounds like kind of a little kid's surface-level question. is an introductory to the faith kind of question, but the more you think about it, the more you unpack that question. What does it mean to be like Jesus? With all the people who are here today, if I asked all of you individually, we'd probably... A lot of us would have many different answers. And probably none of those answers would be wrong. There's lots and lots of faithful, appropriate, scriptural answers to this question of what does it mean to be like Jesus. But as we start this new message series that we're beginning today, and I, I want to share a verse with you that boils this down to just two essential qualities of who Jesus was. If we're going to think about what does it look like, what does it mean to be like Jesus, I think John chapter 1, verse 14 is a good start. It says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Just sit with that for just a moment. probably a familiar passage to many of you. But we're going to spend some time on this passage. We're not just this week going forward. But as I, as I think about this verse, just on the, on the surface level, if we're going to get really, you know, literal and an analytical with things, my mind goes, you know, how can you be full of two things? That doesn't make any sense. You can be half truth and half grace, you know, 50%, 50%, but certainly you cannot be full of both. Okay, I'm not mathematical. Actually, I think I, if any subject in the world exists, I think I hate math more than any of them. But I'm mathematically minded enough to know you can't have like 200% of something. That does not make sense. But the text doesn't say that Jesus was half grace and half truth. It doesn't say that. Nowhere does it say that Jesus was, you know, 30% truth and 70% grace. It says he came from the Father full of both grace and and truth. This tells me that the glory, the character, the nature of the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, is greater than our reasoning, greater than our formulas. Go figure that the God of the universe who created us, who created everything, who knows all the mysteries that have ever existed, is bigger than my tiny, peeny little mind. Wow. He's bigger than that. He's bigger than some of the things that we cannot explain. And if full of grace and truth, it's just, it's just 
gnawing at you, if that's bugging you, guess what? Jesus is also fully human and fully God. Oh my goodness, he's both. That's a different sermon for another day. I'll stop with the, <laughs> with the paradoxes for now. But back to, the, back to this verse. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, came from the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus is what the fullness of truth and the fullness of grace looks like. And so back to our question, what does it mean to be like Jesus? If we want to be like Christ, if we want to embody his character, live out his life, love the way he loves, we must strive for both, both grace and truth. And for us, it's going to be a balance of grace and truth. Because we might not be able to be the fullness of both, you know, as Jesus is, but we can strike a balance a Jesus-like balance of grace and truth in how we relate to others. In how we view the world around us, in our thoughts, in our speech, in our conduct. We can strive for this balance of grace and truth. And a big question I want us to consider as, as we start this series, we're getting into, we're going to be in, in a series for several weeks on this, this idea of grace and truth, what it means to be that as a person, be that as a church, be that to a culture who has all sorts of different ideas about what this means. How do we still love like Christ? A big question we need to start with is why both? Why, 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 why is both necessary? Why can't, why can't she be a truth person and he be a grace person and they can just go about their business? Why can't we just, why, 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 why can't we lean one way or the other. It's a quote I want to share with you, and I want us to think through this a little bit. It's from an author named Randy Alcorn. He writes this. He says, truth without grace denigrates into judgmental legalism. Grace without truth denigrates into deceitful tolerance. And I want us to, I, I've been with this all week. I want you to think on this for a moment. Truth without grace denigrates into judgmental legalism. Okay, get that mental picture in your mind. What does that judgmental legalism look like? Grace without truth denigrates into deceitful tolerance. Just truth, just truth is harsh. Just truth is I'm right, you're wrong. Just truth kills relationships. It is finger pointing. It is rejection. It is failure. It is casting the first stone. Just truth leaves no room for grace. Conversely, just grace. Just grace is soft and, and, and weak. There's no moral authority. Just grace, it's it's. Whatever seems and feels right to you, just, just kind of go for it. There's no consequences. Just grace is no accountability. Just grace seems loving, but it isn't. Just grace seems loving, but it isn't. It's not loving for people to have no boundaries. It's not loving for people to have no authority or guidance. Imagine raising a child like this. Maybe you know some people who kind of are. No, no guidance, no authority. Whatever they want to do is fine because it's just all grace. Whatever you want to do, wherever you want to go, I'm not going to hold you accountable. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to guide you. That's not loving. Just grace leaves no room for truth. Many in our culture are in a place of in their minds, in their hearts, kind of skewing truth and grace. Okay, we talked about this the last couple weeks, rejecting absolute truth, rejecting truth, God's truth, in preference for my truth. Individualized, counterfeit, manufactured, whatever I want it to be, truth, which isn't any truth at all. So we're going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about the church a bit too. Many in the church are in a place of skewing both truth and grace. Using truth as a means of rejecting people, 
using truth as a means of devaluing people. You live this way, so you are under me. You are less than me. And of viewing grace as something to be earned, which is ridiculous. Thank God that he sent his son full of both grace and truth, because being truly loving involves both. Being truly loving involves both truth and grace. Again, it's not loving to stand on harsh truth that labels and rejects and devalues people. And it's not loving to stand on weak grace that does not involve or include any guidance or accountability. If we want to live and love like Jesus, we must pursue this Christ-like balance of grace and truth. We're never going to be the fullness of both. We can't be Jesus. We can't be the fullness of both. But we can make it a focus of our lives to keep both in balance. So let's talk about Jesus a little bit. How does Jesus live out the fullness of grace and truth? How does Jesus live out the fullness of grace and truth? If you know the Gospels, if you know your Bible pretty well, maybe your mind starts coming to some some interactions, some stories, some parables. That, okay, I'm thinking of that, I'm thinking of that. We're going to get to some of those in the future weeks. But as I'm thinking about what's an example of Jesus living this out, one of the first that comes to mind is Jesus with Peter. Jesus with Peter in the events surrounding Good Friday and Easter. So I want to walk through a couple passages with you. We're just going to go through this, kind of to see... Okay, how does Jesus approach Peter? How does Jesus handle Peter in this situation? You should be fairly familiar with these passages, at least the story in general. We'll start in John 13, verse 33. John 13, verse 33. Where Jesus says this. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked. I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? Tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Let's go to Luke chapter 22, verse 54. The story continues. So they arrested him, they arrested Jesus, and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. And Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. But Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I am not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard, weeping bitterly. Last part of the story, John 21. John 21, starting in verse 12. Now come and have some breakfast, the resurrected Jesus said. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. 
Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Let's take mental inventory of this passage for a moment. We covered a lot. Grace and truth. Jesus knew Peter would reject him. Jesus felt the pain of that rejection and still says, come here, Peter. I I made breakfast for us. Come eat with me. Let's sit for a while. I want to talk to you about your leadership role in the church that I'm calling you to. Feed my sheep. We serve a God who in the fullness of truth knows our sin, calls out our sin, and convicts us of our sin and our need for repentance. And we serve a God who in the fullness of grace forgives us, restores us, calls us, and pursues a relationship with us. Oh, how he loves us. This was one example of many, and we're going to cover more in the future weeks, of the fullness of Jesus living out this fullness of grace and truth. And as I read this, I'm just, my conviction is that the world needs this kind of Christ-like love from the church, from me, from the followers of Jesus. A Christ-like love that in truth upholds the authority of God's word, in truth upholds God's guidance, direction, and commands, his authority. And in Christ-like love, that in grace offers forgiveness, restoration, second chances. A love that pursues relationships with sinners, just as Jesus does. I want to leave us, as we enter into this series, I want to leave us with two scriptures to be praying about and meditating through. As we're thinking about this whole Grace and truth balance. Okay, how do I live this out? I, I, maybe in, in your heart you know you're, you know, I, I just know I'm way more of a truth person and there's a little bit of a grace person. I know I need to get a little bit more in balance there. Maybe it's the opposite for you. There's two passages I want us to be praying through in the coming weeks, discussing in our small groups, thinking and praying through in your devotional times. The first is Micah chapter 6, the prophet Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah 6, 6 through 8, the prophet says this. He says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortals, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Act justly, in other words, truth. Love mercy, in other words, grace. And in all of it, walk humbly. So when I was preparing this for this week, this, maybe more than anything else, this, this walk humbly point struck me very strongly. Okay, what, what does this kind of humility look like? What is living out this humility in this, I'm striving for this balance. Okay, how, how then, Lord, do I approach this with a heart of humility, an appropriate heart of humility. I think it is understanding that I am dependent every second on God's grace and truth. Understanding that I am still a work in progress, that 
the Holy Spirit is continually filling and correcting and shaping me. And I'm always going to be needing some, some kind of work. I'm never going to get this right totally. Okay, walking humbly, to me, is in part saying, Lord, church, spouse, kids, friends, the culture around me, when it comes to truth and grace, I don't always get it right. In fact, I often don't get it right. I need help. The more we walk humbly, the more we will understand this approach that John the Baptist took. And I want to, this is the other passage I want to share with you. John chapter 3, verses 26 through 30. John 3, 26 through 30, then we'll, we'll end with this. It says, they came to John, John the Baptist, and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you, you testified about, look, he's baptizing, and everyone's going to him, to Jesus. To this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him. John's kind of setting this, this himself up as sort of like, Jesus is the bride, the church is the, or Jesus is the groom, the church is the bride, and he's sort of the best man on Jesus' side, kind of helping him. It's really cool imagery. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice, talking about Jesus. That joy is mine and is now complete. Verse 30. He must become greater. I must become less. John the Baptist's message to his disciples, his followers, is this is not about me. This is about Jesus. Jesus is doing exactly what he needs to do right now. He must become greater to all of us. He must become greater to me. I must become less. So walking humbly to me is this honest approach that we must acknowledge that what we have to offer, what we have to offer when it comes to grace and truth, it's going to be skewed a little bit that I know that maybe I have a tendency to lean a little bit too, too much toward uh, truth and it comes across as harsh. Maybe I have a tendency to lean a little bit too much toward grace and it comes off as kind of fluffy and cheap. In humility saying, what is within me in my sinful nature is unbalanced. Therefore, give me Jesus. Therefore, I want less of me. Less of my opinions. Less of my preferences, less of my idols, less of my finger pointing, less of my compromises, and more of the grace and truth of Jesus working in and through me. Act justly. Uphold the truth. What is right and good and faithful according to the word of God. Act justly. Love mercy. Love mercy. Take joy in welcoming forgiveness, restoration, sh showing sinners that they are loved despite their flaws. Sharing your story of how you are loved. You discovered Jesus' love for you despite your flaws. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Walk humbly, acknowledging I won't ever get this perfectly right. And neither will you. So every day, every second, we need to walk humbly with Jesus, asking for more and more of him and less and less of us. This is what I want for us, for our church. So over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about some very specific things with this truth and grace balance in our culture, in our church. We're going to talk about our denomination. Our denomination being broken because of a fundamental misunderstanding of grace and truth. And why myself and why our leaders feel it is time to transition away from the United Methodist denomination and go toward a more faithful expression of Methodism. We're going to get more specific about what that all looks like going forward. Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about our, our culture's misunderstanding of grace and truth and how we were still we're called to go into this culture 
loving like Jesus, loving with grace and truth. But first, I think we need to look in, in the mirror. Before we, before we start thinking about, you know, the denominations issues, the cultures issues, all their stuff out there, I need to look at me. We need to look at us. And maybe some ways we've misunderstood, we've mishandled grace and truth. Where do I lean in this grace and truth balance? Does our approach to grace and truth align with Jesus? Does it reflect him well? Do I have the humility to admit that I might need some help understanding and living this out better? Starting today, as you leave, you'll see there are small group questions and, and or questions for either small groups or uh, personal reflection. They're on the table next to the sound booth and they're on the coffee bar. Take those, uh, take those and use them in your small groups. Take those and use them in your personal devotion time. I think what we are talking about is big and complex and everybody's going to have different opinions about it. I think as we unpack this series, it's going to be more impactful to you if we spend some time in our groups and in personal reflection and thinking about those. So on your way out, there's a little half sheet you've labeled, you know, discussion questions, reflection questions. Use those in your small groups. Use those in your personal devotion times. We need to be reflecting on this for us and with one another. But next week, we're going to look at ourselves at a church. Like I said, we're going to look at ourselves before we start looking at everybody else. Exploring what it means to be a Christ-centered church. With grace-filled truth and truth-filled grace. I'm looking forward to walking this journey with you. This is not me being an expert. This is me walking alongside you in this whole thing. I'm excited to be talking about this with you in the future weeks. Let's pray together. Lord God, this is, this is huge. The question that we are asking is essentially, how, how, do we more, how do we be more like Jesus? It's one of the most important questions we could ever ask. How do we be like Jesus to a culture that wants nothing to do with anything we stand for? How do we be like Jesus to a wider denomination that is, is broken and crumbling and making all sorts of compromises? How do I, in my own soul, in my own heart, find a Christ-centered balance when sometimes I'm tempted to lean a little bit toward heavily toward truth and I want to tell everybody what they're doing wrong and what, and what I'm doing right? Maybe sometimes I'm tempted to lean a little bit more toward grace. I'm like, you know what, what they're doing is not that bad. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. How do we find balance in all this? Lord, equip us. Guide our discussions. Guide our messages. Guide our worship going forward. May you be honored by all of it. May you equip us to follow you well. We depend on you. You are the fullness of grace and truth. So mold us. Shape us. Shape your church where you want it to go. And everything, Lord, the glory is yours. Thank you, Jesus, for all of this. So we're going to end <clears throat> with a song that I know all of you know, but <clears throat> there's something about this song that I don't think we often recognize, and it's the first word in the title. It's amazing. When I see something that's amazing, it's something that, like, it's amazing, right? Like, I, I don't just, oh, that's cool. No, it's amazing. It's, it's, there's nothing like it, right? It's something that's incredible. It's, like, mind-blowing. So when we sing something about, like, amazing grace, I think it's something that we have to understand and internalize. As PJ just said, that what Jesus lived out and what he gives us is not just, it's okay grace, or it's acceptable grace. It's, it's really amazing, because if, like me, you realize how much you've screwed up in life or how not great you are, it's amazing. So you guys stay, stand with us and sing Amazing Grace.
That's what makes it amazing, God. There is, <laughs> there isn't a moment in my life in which I don't need grace. How arrogant of me to ever think that. We do good things as humans. You've allowed us to do good things, but those good things are like filthy rags before what you've done for us. God, your love for us is ridiculous. <laughs> it, is, it is amazing that you would forgive some of the offenses and some of the ways that we've just denied you. Uh, like Peter, right? We, we've done things that we know are not okay, and yet we stand oftentimes in judgment of other people doing things that you know are not okay. So God, as we walk through this, and as we wrestle as human beings to not be in Jesus, we, we don't know how to be full of both of these things. We either feel self-righteous or we feel like everything's okay to do in all of the world. And so we ask that you'd help us to look not at ourselves and not at the culture around us, but at Jesus. At the only example to ever walk the earth that was full of grace and truth. God, thank you that that grace that, that we so long for but have a hard time giving <laughs> was freely given. Thank you that in a world in which truth is completely relative, you guide us to what truth is. You are the way, the truth, and life. God, this is a, this is a tough walk. And we, we don't ever want to be characterized as a church full of bigots or, or cold-hearted and indifferent people that just throw the Bible at people, nor do we want to be a church that's like, yeah, whatever you do there, they're cool with it. Like, we want to be people that recognize Jesus, how he lived, and, and we know what it looks like to be obedient to you. But it starts with this amazing grace that you've extended to us. Thank you. Help us walk out of here understanding that it is pretty amazing and that you've given us this truth to walk on. Be with us as we take this journey uh, and understanding how to, how to balance these out. God, we love you so much. Thank you for loving us and our, and our highs and lows and our victories and failures. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. See you guys next week. Oh, there's a special offering. Don't forget, on your way out in the back, feel free to drop it in the basket.